One day, my mother came into my room as I was sitting on the windowsill, staring out. In her abrupt way, she said, Elena, you are acting moony. Enamorada was what she really said. That is, like a girl stupidly infatuated. Since I had turned 14, my mother had been more vigilant than ever. She acted as if I was going to go crazy or explode or something if she didn't watch me and nag me all the time about being a senorita now. She kept talking about virtue, morality, and other subjects that did not interest me in the least. My, was, my mother was unhappy in Patterson, but my father had a good job at the Blue Jeans factory in Passaic, and soon he kept assuring us we would be moving to our own house there. Every Sunday, we drove out to the suburbs of Patterson, Clifton, Passaic, out to where the people mowed grass on Sundays in the summer and where children made snowmen in the winter from pure white snow, not like the gray slush of Patterson, which seemed to fall from the sky in that hue. Okay, so she's creating some contrast for us here, right? This is the suburbs as they compared to her home, right? To the city or Patterson. She's idealizing the suburbs, right? This is a place that sounds much more desirable to her um, because of the, the way that people seem to be able to live there. I had learned to listen to my parents' dreams, which were spoken in Spanish as fairy tales, like the stories about life in the, in the island paradise of Puerto Rico before I was born. Right? So I don't think it's a coincidence that she talks about the dreams being said in Spanish, right? And then compares them to being like fairy tales. Right. Somehow her parents' dreams to her feel disconnected from this world that she's living in, where she's in this city and she's not very happy and she doesn't feel like she belongs. And then her parents have these Spanish language dreams of life in this island paradise of Puerto Rico. Right. She says she's creating the sense of contrast. What's the difference between these two places? So contrast. So we'll say over here in the margins, straight dreams equals Spanish. Island Paradise, and in contrast, right, we've got Reality, English, it's cold, right, she talks about it being winter, it's not an island paradise, it's cold, dirty, right, she talks about the, the snow being gray, not at all an island paradise. I had been to the island once as a little girl to grandmother's funeral and all I remembered was wailing women in black. My mother becoming hysterical and being given a pill that made her sleep two days and me feeling lost in a crowd of strangers all claiming to be my aunts, uncles and cousins. I had actually been glad to return to the city. Interesting. So there are times when she does feel like maybe this is the place she likes to be, right? Even maybe she doesn't like it, but it is home. We had not been back there since then, though my parents talked constantly about buying a house on the beach someday, retiring on the island. That was a common topic among the residents of El Building. As for me, I was going to go to college and become a teacher. All right, so she's got future dreams. But after meeting Eugene, I began to think of the present more than the future. What I wanted now was to enter that house I had watched for so many years. I wanted to see the other rooms where the old people had lived and where the boy spent his time. Most of all, I wanted to sit in the kitchen table with Eugene, like two adults, like the old man and his wife had done, maybe drink some coffee and talk about books. I had started reading Gone with the Wind. I was enthralled by it, with the daring and the passion of the beautiful girl living in a mansion and with her devoted parents and the slaves who did everything for them. It's clearly like this idealized story, right? She's dreaming. I didn't believe such a world had ever really existed. And I wanted to ask Eugene some questions since he and his parents, he had told me, had come from Georgia, the same place where the novel was set. His father worked for a company that had transferred him to Patterson from Georgia. So he's from somewhere else also. His mother was very unhappy, Eugene said, in his beautiful voice that rose and fell over words in a strange, lilting way. 
The kids at school called him the hick and made fun of the way he talked. I knew I was his only friend so far, and I liked that, though I felt sad for him sometimes. Skinny bones and the hick was what they called us at school when we were seen together. So they are, you know, they feel like outcasts, but they have each other. The day Mr. De Palma came out into the cold and asked us to line up in front of him was the day that President Kennedy was shot. Mr. De Palma, a short, muscular man with slicked, back, slicked down black hair, was a science teacher, PE coach, and disciplinarian at PS13. He was the teacher whose homeroom you got assigned if you were a troublemaker. And the man called to break up playground fights and to escort violently angry teenagers to the office. And Mr. De Palma was the man who called your parents for a conference. The day he stood in front of two rows of mostly black, black and Puerto Rican kids, brittle from their efforts to keep moving on a November day that was turning bitter cold. Mr. De Palma, to our complete shock, was crying. Not just silent adult tears, but really sobbing. There were a few titters from the back of, of the line where I stood shivering. Listen. Mr. De Palma raised his arms over his head as if he were about to conduct an orchestra. His voice broke and he covered his face with his hands. His barrel chest was heaving. Someone giggled behind me. Listen, he repeated, something awful has happened. A strange gurgling came from his throat and he turned around and spat on the cement behind him. Gross, someone said, and there was a lot of laughter. The president is dead, you idiots. Nice way for a teacher to talk to students. I should have known that you wouldn't, that wouldn't mean anything to a bunch of losers like you kids. Again, not a very nice way for a teacher to talk to students. Go home. He was shrieking now. No one moved for a minute or two, but then a, a big girl let out a yeah and ran to get her books piled up with the others against the brick wall of the, build, the school building. The others followed in a mad scramble to get to their bags before somebody caught on. It was still an hour to the dismissal bell. A little scared, I headed for L building. There was an eerie feeling on the street. I looked into Mario's drugstore, a favorite hangout for high school for the high school crowd, but there were only a couple of old Jewish men at the soda bar talking with the short with the short order cooks in tones that sounded almost angry, but they were keeping their voices low. Even the traffic on one of the busiest intersections in Patterson, Straight Street and Park Avenue, seemed to be moving slower. So everything is slowing down. There was no, there were no horns blasting that day. At L Building, the usual group of unemployed men were not hanging out on the front stoop, making it difficult for women to enter the front door. No music spilled from the open doors in the hallway. And when I walked into our apartment, I found my mother sitting in front of the grainy picture of the television set. She looked up at me with a tear-streaked face and just said, Dios mío, turning back to the set as if it were pulling at her eyes. I went into my room. Though I wanted to feel the right thing about President Kennedy's death, I could not fight the feeling of elation that stirred in my chest. She's got some conflict here, right? She knows that it's sad that the president has died, but that she is also excited about something. Today was the day I was going to visit Eugene in his house. He had asked me to come over after school to study for an American history test with him. Aha, that's probably why the story is called that, or at least some reference to that. I looked down into his yard. Oh, whoops, skipped a line, sorry. Uh, we had also planned to walk to the public library together. I looked down into his yard. The oak tree was bare of leaves and the ground looked gray with ice. The light through the large kitchen window of his house told me that L building blocked the sun to such an extent that they had to turn lights on in the middle of the day. I felt ashamed about it. It's an interesting emotion. She's ashamed that her building blocks the sun from his house. Not sure what to make of that. But the white kitchen table with the lamp hanging just above it looked cozy and inviting. I would soon sit there across from Eugene and would tell him about my perch just above his house. Maybe I should, and, and maybe I should. 
In the next 30 minutes, I changed my clothes, put on a little pink lipstick and got my mother's and got my books together. Then I went in to tell my mother that I was going to a friend's house to study. I didn't expect her reaction. You're going out today? The way she said today sounded as if a storm warning had been issued. It was said in utter disbelief. Before I could answer, she came towards me and held my elbows as, a cl as I clutched my book. Ika, the president has been killed. We must show respect. He was a great man. Come to church with me tonight. She tried to embrace me, but my books were in the way. My first impulse was to comfort her. She seemed so distraught, but I had to meet Eugene in 15 minutes. I have a test to study for, Mama. I will be home by eight. You are forgetting who you, you are forgetting who you are, Nina. I have seen you staring down at that boy's house. You are heading for humiliation and pain. My mother said this in Spanish and in a resigned tone that surprised me as if she had no intention of stopping me from heading for humiliation and pain. I started for the door. She sat in front of the TV, holding a white handkerchief to her face. I walked out to the street and around the chain link fence that separated L building from Eugene's house. The yard was neatly edged around the little walk that led to the door. It always amazed me how Patterson, the inner core of the city, had no apparent logic to its architecture. Small, neat, single residences, like this one, could be found right next to huge dilapidated apartment buildings, apartment buildings like L Building. My guess was that the little houses had been there first. Then the immigrants had come in droves and the monstrosities had been raised for them. The Italians, the Irish, the Jews, and now us, the Puerto Ricans and the Blacks. The door was painted a deep green, verde, the color of hope. I had heard my mother say it, verde esperanza. Take a second here. I'm not going to go too much into this right now, but I think there's definitely some symbolism here, right? She's talking about waves of immigration and perhaps the development that happened before immigration and then immigration that comes after that and so forth. Consider how that ties back into um, our readings from last week from Quinlan and Kennedy and talking about the sort of almost, if you think about this city, how, how it would perhaps match that patchwork quilt idea, right? There's some connection there. It's all sort of hodgepodge together in the same way that Quinlan talks about in her essay. Okay, make some notes for myself there. I knocked softly. A few suspenseful moments later, the door opened just a crack. The red, swollen face of a woman appeared. She had a halo of red hair floating over a delicate ivory face, the face of a doll with freckles on the nose. Her smudged eye makeup made her look unreal to me, like a mannequin seen through a warped store window. What do you want? Her voice was tiny and sweet sounding like a little girl's, but her tone was not friendly. I'm Eugene's friend. He asked me over to study. I thrust out my book, a silly gesture that embarrassed me almost immediately. You live there? She pointed up to L building, which looked particularly ugly, like a gray prison with its many dirty windows and rusty fire escapes. The woman had stepped halfway out and I could see that she wore a white nurse's uniform with St. Joseph's Hospital on the name tag. Yes, I do. She looked intently at me for a couple of heartbeats and then said, as if to herself, I don't know how you people do it. Then directly to me, listen, honey. Eugene doesn't want to study with you. He is a smart boy, doesn't need help. You understand me. I'm truly sorry if he told you you could come over. He cannot study with you. It's nothing personal, you understand. We won't be in this place much longer. No need for him to get close to people. It'll just make it harder for him later. Run back home now. I couldn't move. I just stood there in shock at hearing these things said to me in such a honey-drenched voice. I'd never heard an accent like hers except for Eugene's softer version. It was as if she were singing me a little song. What's wrong? Didn't you hear what I said? She seemed very angry, and I finally snapped out of my trance. I turned away from the green door and heard her close it gently. Our apartment was empty when I got home. My mother was in someone else's kitchen, seeking the solace she needed. Father would come in from his late shift at midnight. I would hear them talking softly in the kitchen for hours that night. They would not discuss their dreams for the future or life in Puerto Rico, as they often did. 
That night, they would talk sadly about the young widow and her two children. That would be um, Kennedy's wife and children. As if they were, as if they were family. For the next few days, we would observe Luto in our apartment. That is, we would practice restraint and silence. No loud music or laughter. Some of the women in our building would wear black for weeks. That night, I lay in my bed trying to feel the right thing for our dead president. But the tears that came up from a deep source inside me were strictly for me. When my mother came to the door, I pretended to be sleeping. Sometime during the night, I saw from my bed the street, the street light come on. It had a pink halo around it. I went to my window and pressed my face through the cool glass. Looking up at the light, I could see the white snow falling like a lace veil over its face. It did not, I did not look down to see it turning gray as it touched the ground below. Good. So this is contrast at the end, right? And this reference back to her earlier talking about the snow being white in the suburbs and gray where she is, right? She's just thinking, idealizing this white snow falling sort of fresh start cleansing where she is. 